Good morning, this is Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks <coughs> Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, antibiotic choices for otitis media. This is part of our ongoing series for medical professionals. Um, if you're a medical professional, student, or, or resident, and you're interested in scheduling a rotation, our office can be contacted at 775-359-7111. So today I have two students with me who wish to remain anonymous. They'll be off camera talking at student one and student two. And they wish me that I not tell you what kind of student they are. So we'll assume they're not high school students uh, doing this. And we're going to be, among other things, referencing um, a paper that I don't have in front of me. Can one of you hand me the paper? Thank you. Uh, just so I can give you the reference. It is from... Um, Principles on Judicious Use of Antimicrobial Agents from the supplement in uh, the journal Pediatrics from 1990 something. 1990, I want to say 7. Yeah, 97. Okay, so in dealing with otitis media and sinusitis, there are three big bacterial infections that we deal with. And we realize a certain number of these are caused by viruses, and there's all kinds of estimates as to how many of these infections are viral. Uh, and we don't really know, but it's probably a good percentage of them are viral. But since we can't tell what's what, we tend to treat. Uh, if you're going to treat these infections, and we'll talk in a little bit about not treating them, but if you are going to treat these infections, there's three bacteria that are responsible for most of the infections. What are they? Strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia. Strep pneumo. Strep pneumo. Um, Haemophilus influenza. Not type B, right? And um, Moraxella cataralis. Okay. And those three bugs each have, well, two of the three anyway, have um, unique forms of antibiotic resistance. The third one has is redundant from from one of the others. So how do they how do they resist antibiotics? What strep pneumo do? <clears throat> That's a gram positive, mm -hmm. and um, it, I think it's because it has the penicillin binding proteins. Okay, it alters so its it, penicillin binding proteins exactly. So it, the penicillin, the antibiotic, isn't able to break through. Okay, that so and, and that essentially makes it ineffective. So how do we counter alterations in penicillin binding proteins? By, act, by adding a bactericidal? Well, the antibiotic that we're using is bactericidal anyway. So then, then it's the other one. The, um, no, no, you're, 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 you're right in kind of the, the basic part of your thinking. What, what do you think, what other student? Um, mechanism of penicillin resistance as pneumoniae. Um, we alteration of PCN binding proteins, the transpeptidase. Mm hmm so how do you how do you counteract that? With adding what's that second part of oh, the beta? Yeah. No, nope, that actually that actually counteracts um, beta lactamase production. So okay. cell wall synthesis of cephalosporin. So you think of either you guys watch sports? Do you watch football at all? Okay, I'm I'm I don't watch a lot of sports, but I've played a lot of sports and I know a little bit about football. So if you imagine a f oh go ahead. <laughs> so. Um, the high dose will yield middle ear infections that exceed the minimum inhibitory concentration S pneumoniae that are intermediate in resistance to PCM. Yeah, so you use high dose <laughs> antibiotic. Okay. Oh, okay. And the way to think of it is, is it's like a football game, okay? The quarterback is the bacteria, and the guy's rushing, those are your antibiotics. And of course, you've got to rush past the linemen for the, for the offense, okay? The guards and the tackles and the center that are there, and they're trying to stop the antibiotic from rushing and sacking the penicillin, or sacking the uh, bacterium. So, you know, normally there's like five guys that are blocking, but you could have your whole team block if you wanted to. So if you have more blockers, and you still want to sack the quarterback, you got to get them somehow. How do you do that? You do that with a blitz. You have more people come from, from elsewhere in the defense and come up to the line and rush too. You put more rushers on the line. And um, then you can get the quarterback. And we do the same thing here. This is where high-dose amoxicillin comes in. 
to say 80 to 100 per kilo. Most strap pneumo these days is intermediate at, at minimum resistant. So um, 80 to 100 per kilo is going to be an important kind of dosing thing for you. Um, and, and that's the way you're going to get around it. Okay, so adding augmentin to strep pneumo doesn't do you any good. You need more amoxicillin. Realize that if you're treating strep throat, that's group A beta hemolytic strep, or if you're treating a urinary tract infection, that's, you know, not strep pneumo. You don't need high-dose amoxicillin. 20 to 40 per kilo is appropriate. But if you're treating otitis menia or sinusitis, 80 to 100 per kilo per day is the, the dose of choice. Okay, so what about H flu? How does it make its resistance? It's gram negative. It's a gram negative rod. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Let's put it in. I'll give you a hint. If it's not alteration in penicillin binding protein, what is the alternative? The B lactam. A beta lactamase producer. Mm -hmm. So if it produces a beta lactamase, how do we counter that? With an inhibitory. With a beta lactamase inhibitor, clavulonic acid is one way to do it. Okay. In both okay. cases, you can use um, anti. You can use uh, any pneumococcal um, cephalosporins that don't attach to penicillin binding proteins, or you can use beta lactamase resistant cephalosporins. But that's another way to do it, is with a beta lactamase inhibitor. And that's the Omnicef. Uh, Omnicef one? is one, one beta lactamase resistant uh, cephalosporin. Okay, but um, Augmentin is the other way, and it's kind of a more old fashioned way to do it. The paper I gave you doesn't refer to Omnicef because it was written before Omnicef hit the market. But at least here in this community, Omnicef has replaced Augmentin as the second line drug just because it's better tolerated GI wise and it's a little bit cheaper mm -hmm. uh, and has roughly the same antimicrobial uh, patterns. You will notice Zithromax is not listed. The macrolids are macromolecules, they don't penetrate well into the sinuses or the middle ears. Consequently, they don't work real well. They have a very high first line failure rate. Now, they do have a role in otitis media and sinusitis. When you fail everything else, sometimes you will respond to a macrolid, but they're a horrible first-line drug. So I don't recommend them as first-line drugs. If you're allergic to amoxicillin, you should probably use a cephalosporin, not azithromycin. And to throw azithromycin into kids simply because, well, it kills everything. No, it doesn't, and good chance it won't kill your OM. Um, Morax elecateralis is a... a beta lactamase producer as well. So by mm -hmm. talking about H flu, we've talked about more axella. So that's kind of OM in a nutshell. This is Dr. Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Again, our number is 355-7219, and that's area code 775. That's right, that's not our phone number at all. It's 359-7111. Have a good day.